So we continue with our conversation, and this is about anti-doping and the 2021 anti-doping laws. We get back into conversation with Bildad Rogoncho, who's the head of legal services at the Anti-Doping Agency of Kenya. He had given us an insight onto what is required for testing, and now we get back and get into a conversation with Bildad, and it is about the results management standard that has been introduced. Bildad, give us now, uh, get back to us and give us an oversight of the results management protocol that are now in place. Thank you, thank you Wahone. Um, maybe just to stress out that uh, one of the key uh, changes that are, is uh, prominently pronounced in the International Stand for Results Management is the issue of the timelines. Uh, it is now demanded uh, by the code that all anti-doping rule violation cases must be instituted, had and determined, and actually concluded within a period of six months. And this is very, very important. Uh, we have not had a, a big challenge when it comes to meeting these times because the sports dispute tribunal uh, has been working very well. So what we intend to do basically is just uh, ensure that we are able to conclude our matters within the most reasonable time, but of course, adhering to the six month uh, uh, rule. Now, uh, another thing that is very prominent in the international standard for resource management uh, is the issue of confidentiality. As you're aware, uh, I cannot be able to discuss with you about any ongoing cases uh, touching on, on athletes. Uh, this is due to the confidentiality clause in the code. And remember, and this is something that was actually in the public domain, on the issue of public disclosure of uh, decisions that have been rendered, either in Kenya or in any other part of the world, especially touching on minors. Now, the international standard has actually uh, spoken uh, about this issue. And basically what it provides for is that uh, all protected persons' uh, decisions can only be disclosed if the decision that has been delivered touches on issues that are aggravating. For example, use of non-specified uh, substances. But in minor offenses, the, um, or the results management panel or the National Anti-Doping Organization is not required to actually uh, do the public uh, disclosure. It's a very, very interesting document to all. I call upon anyone who can get their hands on it. It's actually on our website, uh, the Anti-Doping Agency of Kenya website, and just go through it to all. Now, I also want to mention about the introduction of the results management panel. <laughs> Where does this come in vis-a-vis -vis the Sports Dispute Tribunal? What are going to be, you know, the roles of the two bodies so that there is clarity? Because it's an issue that, you know, federation people have uh, raised and say, where does the results management panel come in the RMP vis-a-vis -vis the SDT? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. I, I think um, I, it's important that we clarify on how these two organs are going to work uh, side by side. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, is that uh, Kenya's system of having the anti-doping agency of Kenya separate from the sports dispute tribunal has been loaded as a very, very good uh, I mean, uh, organ. And that system actually has worked very well. Now, one of the changes in the, court, in the 2021 code is the issue of operational and institutional independence of hearing panels. Now, what we have proposed to do and what we have introduced as our Section 31A of the new Act, basically, is to introduce this creature, which is we call the Resource Management Panel, which will handle all anti-doping rule violation cases in the first instance. Now, what do I mean by that, Wahame? Basically, it means that all appeals from the Resource Management Panel will lie the Sports Dispute Tribunal. And this is informed by the fact that we have noted that Sports Dispute Tribunal is very knowledgeable on matters uh, anti-doping. And therefore, it is important that we give them a platform to be able to hear uh, appeals uh, touching on the national level athletes. Let me clarify that actually, the international level athletes, their appeals will not be heard by the Sports Dispute Tribunal, but they will be heard by the Court of Arbitration for Sport in Lausanne, Switzerland. Well, I hope I've made that a bit clear. At least now that is clear when it comes to national level athletes and international level athletes 
And now, here mm -hmm. comes the, uh, the question. Despite yes. the lockdown and, uh, you know, all the restrictions that were brought in through uh, coronavirus and all that, mm -hmm. EDAC has continued with its work. Um, yes. You know, sample collection, doping control, and that means that if there are any anti-doping rule violations that have come in over that period, then how yes. is this going to be managed? How is the transition between the matters that are at the Sports Dispute Tribunal or may have to go to the Sports Dispute Tribunal and those that will now be handled internally by the Results Management Panel? How will that be handled? Uh, very well, Mohamed. Basically, what we intend to do as an agency is ensure that the matters that are still pending before the Sports Dispute Tribunal will be heard to conclusion at the Sports Dispute Tribunal. If you look at the Act as it was, you would find that the hearing panels of this anti-doping rule violation in the, in the first instance and in the appellate uh, stage are different hearing panels. And that system has worked very well. So for anyone who has a matter pending before the Sports Dispute Tribunal, that matter will be heard and determined by the sports dispute tribunal. But for all the matters, and I'm glad that you've noted that uh, actually ADAC did not take a break even during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, that is last year, we actually worked throughout. And basically, we came up with, I mean, we were complying with all the protocols that are in place, but we ensured that we do not sleep because that would have given unscrupulous uh, characters an opportunity to engage in uh, acts that we do not condone. And therefore, for the new cases that we're going to receive now in 2021, this will be handled in accordance to the provisions of the results management panel once it is operational and working. Now, move on, uh, moving on to something else, and uh, I'll make cross-references to, you know, decisions and instances. Um, probably some ADAC have been there, others, other decisions have been made by global bodies. Is how now the Anti-Doping Agency of Kenya would work in the case of where you've got an international competition in Kenya, what's required of the court, um, or if you're told to work with a global body, for example, with the AIU, for example, at the World Under-20 Championships. How yes. then do you coordinate with these bodies? And I want to make reference to a story from three years ago. A delegation, yes. a foreign delegation, came to the country and uh, they were playing against uh, a Kenyan representative team, but the members of that delegation declined to have their samples taken. I know the matter was, uh, und I mean, explained and understood. How does the uh, current code then allow that EDAC can work with, say, a continental federation or a global federation? Uh, very well, honey. And uh, I can see you're trying to drag me to discuss that particular matter. <laughs> no, 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 not, not the matter, but the scenario. <laughs> Yes. Uh, basically, what happens, uh, oh man, if I may put this very uh, clearly, is that uh, the Anti-Doping Agency of Kenya has the authority to conduct sample collection on any athlete within uh, the borders of Kenya. That is from the outset. Now, what happens under testing is very simple, is that according to the international standards, what we have, what a, a national anti-doping organization is required to do is prepare what you call a registered testing pool. Now, this registered testing, testing pool are those athletes which the agency will ensure testing is conducted minimum seven times within a period of 12 months. Now, how does this then work when it comes to the international federations? Now, the international federations have their own registered testing pools. And of course, you will find that in these uh, international uh, federations register testing pools, there will be even Kenyan athletes. So what happens basically is that as an agency, we will not be concerned with testing those athletes who are in the international federation register testing pool just to avoid duplication. So basically, if we have an international event in Kenya, and uh, an, an international federation wishes for sample collection to be conducted, what we have done as an agency, we have entered into collaborative agreements with most international federations uh, or anti-doping uh, organizations, basically to help them with the sample collection processes. It is, of course, it makes a lot of financial uh, I mean, uh, sense when we do that, so that they don't have to send their representatives to come all the way to Kenya to, uh, to conduct a sample collection. Now, 
Once we have done the sample collection, remember, we are not going to take the authority to conduct results management over these are three if they just positive. That prerogative remains with uh, the person or the body which has requested for the sample collection. I, I, I really hope it has come out clearly. Yeah, now that is clear. The other one that I'd like to bring up is therapeutic use exemption. And I think mm -hmm. towards the end of last year, and uh, the Confederation of African Football sanctioned uh, football. I think it was a two-week or two-month uh, sanction. It was one of, I think, the sh shortest sanctions I've seen for to do with the TUE. Then the question yes. arises now, how is therapeutic use exemption, um, you know, a substance that is on the prohibited list but is required for a medical regime? Then how is this going to be managed, you know, ensuring that, one, the particular athletes get the required treatment and at the same time, the TUE is issued in good time such that an athlete who is recovering may not fall foul of the laws? Uh, thank you very much for that question. Uh, in fact, uh, TUE is one of those areas of concern that we have as an agency because since 2016, we have had only nine applications for TUE. Nine? Uh, <laughs> nine applications. Only nine applications. And I can tell you for free that basically uh, we have had athletes whom we have prosecuted before the sports district tribunal who if they had applied for a tue they would not have had to go through that particular process uh, basically a tue gives an athlete an opportunity to use a, a substance or a method that would ordinarily be prohibited now there is a criteria for granting that TUE. one is that it must be for medical purposes and number two, that there is no alternative medication to whatever the athlete is suffering from, be it an illness or an injury. And finally, that the use of that substance will not give that athlete any undue uh, uh, advantage uh, over the other uh, athletes. Now, I wish actually to call upon athletes to make good use of this particular provision. It is provided for under Section 24 of our Act, and it provide there's a committee which sits and looks at their plea, evaluates the same and the grants. So I have I have never understood why our athletes have really uh, not taken this up completely well. Now the other one that uh, we've seen a lot of sanctioning Alfred Kinkater, Luvo Manyong of South Africa, Christian Coleman, uh Salwa Ibnasa, um Wilson uh keeps saying and all that. Where about failures? Where are you at a particular time? Because that's now going to, it's now actually the elephant in the room for so many people. How is that being implemented? Uh, let, me, let me start by saying that uh, issues of whereabouts failure. Uh, one, it is one of the 11 uh, anti-doping rule violations. Uh, and the athletes have actually been educated on this. And I may say that in most instances, you find it is just out of ignorance uh, that uh, someone gets caught up in this. Remember, you have to fail three times within a period of 12 months, surely as an athlete. And, uh, and I feel, especially when it comes to the international level athletes, who should actually know better uh, on uh, what to do when it, com when it comes to whereabouts failure. And it is important to mention and uh, for the public to understand that whereabouts failure does not mean that the athlete has used any prohibited substance. So that the, the notion that somebody has been banned be, because of whereabouts failure, uh, that the public will then deem it as if that particular athlete used up, uh, any uh, of the prohibited substances. Far from it. Athletes are required to inform, especially for the athletes. These are and that is on the athletes on the register testing pool. They're supposed to log in and ensure that they update uh, their whereabouts every single day. And this is done actually on a quarterly basis, so that we know where they are and how to find them and uh, collect uh, sample collection. We have made the process so easy that now we even have an app which they can be able to access uh, from their phone. So we have done all that we can as an agency, but we will not relent. We will continue educating our athletes 
on how to fill their whereabouts so that we can get this. And I call it a minor offense uh, from our systems. Now, the other thing is that there is more responsibility for federations now. They've got to draw up rules and policies mm -hmm. to do with anti-doping. And, and this is with respect and with guidance from the Anti-Doping Agency of Kenya. What's the way yes. forward with this particular one? Because we know we've got the laws, we've got the policy, we've got the regulations. How are the, international, uh, how are the local federations now going to take this up? Um... Uh, let me let me mention that um, uh, all national federations are required by the court to align uh, their uh, enabling statutes and uh, I, I mean these are the, the, the regulations, the rules, the constitutions with the provisions of the court, and this is mandatory. If you look at Section 41B of our Act, it provides for that, that they are required to comply accordingly. As an agency, we are tasked with, one, educating, capacity building uh, these federations for them to understand what is their role and how they can go to, do, uh, to align uh, their documents with the code, which we will always uh, do. Now, as an agency, we are also tasked with conducting audits. And I can, uh, can put this in the public domain, that nine of the federations in, in Kenya have actually complied. There's just a few that are still lagging behind, but we are ensuring that we are doing all that we can to ensure that all of them are able to align their documents with uh, the code. And this just basically means that their documents should be able to mention something to do with the anti-doping process or the anti-doping program and what measures they are putting in place to ensure that their members, and these are their athletes, are educated on uh, anti-doping uh, matters. Wahome. Now, another one is the enhanced um, responsibilities on athletes and athlete support personnel. Maybe you could yes. clarify on this and specific things that athletes should know and the people who work around them, athletes support personnel as they are yes. known. Very well. Uh, very well, Wahome. Uh, one of the things, and I think most athletes by, uh, by now know very well, is that uh, all athletes are deemed to know the provisions of the court. And that is why we are organizing all these workshops, all these outreach programs, so that we can enlighten them on what the court uh, provides. One of the things, and this is very important for the athlete, is that uh, an athlete is not allowed during results management to plead ignorance. As an athlete, you're not allowed to appear before the hearing panel and state that I did not know that evading is actually an offense. I did not know that uh, EPO is a banned substance. That is not allowed. You are required to know what the court uh, provides. And it is incumbent upon them uh, uh, to know the provisions. Now, one, uh, one of the things I'll call upon, and this is together with the athletes and the athlete support personnel, the coaches, the managers, the agents, is that please, please, please attend our workshops, attend our outreach programs, if you cannot be able to do that, attend our webinars. We have held quite a number of webinars, especially during this uh, pandemic period. And we invite everyone who is in the sporting uh, field to ensure that they attend and they get to learn. We have, and this is uh, one of the uh, innovations that was made by, by the agency, we have an e-learning portal on our website. And you can be able to go there and test yourself as a, either an athlete or an athlete support personnel, and especially for the athlete support personnel, because these are the people that these athletes actually uh, rely on. So you as an athlete support personnel should be knowledgeable on matters uh, anti-doping. So that we are inviting you, look at the e-learning portal, get to learn as much as possible. And if you can, access the WADA website. There is a lot that uh, one can be able to pick uh, from that platform. Uh, Builded um, closing words from you as far as the 2021 code is concerned and areas that of concern or that, you know, at times people may think are a little bit confusing about the new code going forward that must be known this early in the year. Uh, very well, uh, uh, One of the things that I want to uh, tell uh, so the sporting fraternity is basically one, that uh, uh, despite uh, the fact that we are living the new normal, as an agency, we are still going on with our work. 
So do not be duped uh, to think that uh, uh, the agency will not uh, catch up with you, especially if you're an unscrupulous uh, character. Uh, and secondly, that for anybody who is involved in sports, please take time and familiarize yourself with the court. And for the athletes, find a copy of the prohibited list for 2021 and look at it and see the substances which we are not supposed to use. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't uh, um, reiterate that anymore. Well, no. Thank you very much. Bildad Roboncho, he's the head of legal services at the Anti-Doping Agency of Kenya, giving us insights into the 2021 anti-doping laws. And remember, these laws come through the World Anti-Doping Agency Code, which Kenya is code compliant from 2004, 2009, 2015, and now 2021. Those are the changes that have been made there with enhancements. And remember, it's all about clean sport. If you're caught, you are on your own and you cannot plead ignorance. Thank you very much. Bill, that will keep the conversation going and uh, have a good morning. Well, time for us now to take a little break and after that we'll be getting into a conversation about football, heavily African football. There is an East African derby tonight. By the way, it's Uganda and Rwanda. The two teams, what's the story around them? B despite sharing a border, there's a coach who's handled both sides. We'll be looking at that and what's been going down over the weekend and much more. Our sign language interpreter over the first hour was Lenza Odingo and right now we are with Simon Carotha. A short break and we'll be back with John Agriotieno and Aldrin Nsubuga. <laughs>